I probably had two other jobs because every six months I would just get that feeling like unhappiness again. So I would go and search for that happiness again, get a new job, feel good for six months. Then that pit in my stomach comes back. I don't want to be here. I don't want to sit in this office all day. And then it was finally, and then I, I think the last job before I finally stopped going from job to job, the, the, my bosses would literally like tell me my last job, I was actually fired because my boss was like, we can sense you're not happy here. We really want you to go out and do what makes you happy. And he gave me a severance and everything, but he just knew that I wasn't happy. And then that is how I transitioned into the yoga stuff. Welcome to the Pretty Girl Sweat Show, which highlights women who are balancing demanding careers with a healthy lifestyle and hurtling over personal and professional obstacles. Each week, I have a sister-to-sister chat with an inspiring go-getter, and listeners learn how good things come to those who sweat. Jamie Ratliff is an Atlanta-based certified yoga teacher and passionate advocate for living a life she loves. She credits her yoga practice as being one of the tools in her self-care regimen that has helped her get through life's difficult seasons. While Jamie wholeheartedly believes yoga is accessible to everyone, the desire to share her practice as a teacher stems from a sensitive reality that the yoga community strongly lacks diversity, both on a local and global scale. She believes that anything is possible once you start believing in yourself and wants to encourage you to not let fear take the driver's seat of your life. Just start. Take the first step and witness the beauty that unfolds. So I grew up um, in Atlanta, actually, in the suburbs outside of Atlanta um, called Mableton's little, you know, if you, if you blink, you'll miss it. (laughs) And, um, I grew up here and I am the middle child. So I have an older sister and a younger brother. And I was just always that child that did what I was told. I listened to my mom and dad. Um, and I, I made good grades. I was, you know, out, outgoing in school on the honor roll and beta club. And it was a cheerleader and. That was, I mean, that's how I was growing up. I was very, um, I did my homework on time when I came home and I was just that very kind of like independent and responsible child. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) And how do you think maybe that, um, impacted your life? You being that way. That has just made me very, I've just always been a very focused person, just very driven, very ambitious. I've always... I, yeah, I think the best word was just be focused. Like I always wanted to make good grades. I always, I mean, I would iron my clothes before the day before school and have them laid out on my bed. And I, you know, I would set my own alarms. Like my mom wouldn't have to wake me up. So I think that that set the tone for how I am now, just a very focused, driven kind of tunnel vision person. Like when I set my mind to something, I just go after it. And I'm just like, that's all I'm focused on, like getting to this goal and how am I going to achieve this and how am I going to create this life that I love? So I think that having those core values from an early age definitely rolled into my young adult life. Well, first of all, can you please come to my house and inspire my children to lay out their clothes <laughs> and iron them the night before because they don't have that inspiration. So <laughs> where, where did your inspiration come from for, for being the way that you were? Did it just come naturally or did your mom influence you or your dad? Well, my mom, they both really, really influenced me. Like my mom, she's a very organized person and she, um, so she taught me how to clean properly and how to be organized and color coded my closet. And that, that's, that's her side of, of the spectrum. And then my dad, he's the, um, the more punctual, um, person. And he gave me lessons on credit and how, you know, you should, the importance of having good credit and making good grades. And so they were both like very key you know, they had their own set of things that both like together combined helps me become who I am. Mm. What did your parents do um, for a living? 
So my mom is a tax accountant and my dad has been working with Pepsi for a while. So um, the displays that you see when you go in like Kroger, like the Super Bowl displays and all that, he, he does all that. And then my mom, she's She's the number cruncher. She does all the taxes. She used to work for um, Verizon Wireless in the tax department. And so, yeah. And then she's also um, a licensed real estate agent. And um, she also, she, she wears many hats too. She, um, she started um, her event planning and organization company and she throws these annual events called Dish Date in a Bottle. So we have this really amazing backyard and the only requirements for people that come is bring a dish, a date and a bottle. And it's a really cute mm, concept. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, so she she does her big soirees like you know Great Gatsby type thing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> um, yeah, but she just she's a socialite, so she loves that. Oh, that's pretty cool. All right, so you did not follow completely no. in your parents' footsteps. No. <laughs> so let's talk about the high school and um, where your direction kind of like took a turn. At one point, were you thinking about doing something similar to them and then you switched your mind or were you always focused on this like healthy career? Well, I have, I wasn't always health conscious. Um, that didn't come until after college, but I, I am just a naturally creative person. So I love to write and, and create things. And so at a very young age, I was just really good at writing. I mean, I won the dare essay competition in the fifth grade. And so I just loved expressing myself through writing. And so I loved, um, English literature was like my favorite subject. I love writing essays and, um, I love learning new words and different languages. And so, when I was well, going through, well, when I got to college and I went to Spelman College, I, I majored in English because I just loved writing. And that was a very versatile uh, degree because I knew that I didn't want to be like a lawyer or a doctor, like a really targeted thing. So I was kind of confused at that point in my life. And I just felt like with English, I could, you know, maybe do journalism or maybe do public relations or marketing, social media stuff. So I just went that route because I knew I had lots of options. Mm. And why Spelman out of um, all the schools to choose from? So it's a really funny story, but... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when you're young and you have your boyfriend and you, you kind of want to go where he goes. <laughs> <laughs> so at the time, my boyfriend then was going to, um, Morehouse and, you know, it was just like the thing, like Morehouse man, Spelman woman, you know, like that was like, you know, you dated a Morehouse man. Yeah. So. So, and, and on top of that, I just knew that it was a really good institution. You know, a lot of great women came from that and I need to be around that sisterhood and that culture to feel like I'm an empowered black woman. So it was, it was more than just, Oh, my, my boo goes to Morehouse. It was, you know, it was two things combined. I knew that I wanted, I, I did I wasn't sure if I wanted to go out of state and I just knew that Spellman produced some amazing women. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but it didn't, it didn't, the road wasn't like perfectly straight. I actually, my parents really wanted me to go away. Mm. And so, um, I actually ended up going to Tuskegee University for one year. Mm. And, um, I told them like, well, I'll do this for one year, but I'm going to transfer to Spelman. And that's exactly what I did. That, that goes back to being driven and focused. Like I knew that I didn't really want to go to Tuskegee University, although it was a really good experience. It turned out to be, um, more than what I thought. Like my whole freshman experience there was amazing, but I still in the back of my mind knew that I wanted to go to Spelman. Like I wanted to be a Spelman woman. And after that year, like behind the scenes, you know, my parents were like, Oh, how are you loving it? I'm like, good. And then behind the scenes, I'm getting all my paperwork together to transfer. <laughs> and then I, you know, I tell them like, once I got accepted, like, Oh, I'm transferring, I'm coming back home. And then of course, once I got back home, that relationship with that boyfriend at the time didn't last. Of course. I mean, we were young, mm-hmm. but it was a really good experience still. I'm still glad that I made the decision and yeah. Wow. So you can say that dating did play 
a role <laughs> in your yeah. collegiate career, for but, sure. for the, but for a good, in a good way though. In mm-hmm. a good way. So, um, okay. So time management is a struggle for so many people. What did you do in college that um, helped you become a more efficient student? In college, what did I do? Okay. So outside of partying a lot, (laughs) um, I don't know. I just, to me, I feel like if I'm going to pay all this money to go to school and take out all these loans and stuff, then I better get it together and, you know, make the good grades, you you know, so it's different when you're going, when you're in high school and you're not, you're not investing in, in your education, but the tables turn when you get in college, like it, no one's going to wake you up. No one's going to tell you do your homework. No one's going to make sure you come to class. So again, it really wasn't something that I had to do. I was just that driven, motivated person. So even if I went out, I knew that I had to wake up and go to class or I knew that I had to, maybe some nights I can't go out because I have to finish this paper. So it was just a balance. Like I think balance in all things is just the, the way to go. And so there's a time to play and there's a time to work. And I just, I think that I never really had a set routine. I just do everything in moderation. Like I know when something's due and I know what I need to buckle down or when I can't procrastinate any longer and I need to get it done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so say you waited to the last minute to study for a test, any kind of method, did you, did you use any kind of like, certain method to make sure that you retain the information? Yeah, I'm pretty much like a repetition type person. So I like making flashcards and um, writing out information and, you know, getting quizzed by my roommate. Mm -hmm. And I would do things like that. And, you know, obviously if it was like, if I needed to read something, like I would reread chapters and just like try to remember like key points. And, but definitely the flashcards help and just quizzing each other. But eventually you have to put all that up and get some rest because I think sometimes in school we can do these all nighters and stay up all night. But one thing that is, is really important is resting. So it's a lot of times we feel like we have to do, 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 but when we are resting, that's when we really, our bodies and our minds reap the most benefits. So I would like, I would study and, you know, really focus, but then I would have my cutoff point. Like, I'm not going to stay up all night. I'm going to get some rest. And then in the morning I would wake up and while I'm in the shower, all the information would just be there. Like it would just like, like it would just come to mind like that because you really have to give your brain a break too. Mm -hmm. And if you overstudy, then you really, you're not doing yourself any, any justice. So you have Mm -hmm. to kind of back off, trust that, you know, the information. And then when you see it on the test, it comes back to mind anyway. Yeah. For sure. So tell us about your first job. Was it what you expected you would be doing when you were a freshman in college? My first job. So when I was a freshman in college, I actually didn't work because I was um, in Alabama, in Tuskegee. So when I came back, when I started um, at Spelman, I worked at a hair salon in spa. Okay. And, but even before then in high school, I worked at like Wendy's and Quiznos. I mean, yeah, I worked in the fast food. I, I, I had my run of fast food. <laughs> job. But, um, but yeah, when I came back, I, um, worked at a salon in Spawn Atlanta and I was the, one of the front desk receptionists and it was a, it was, it was a good little setup. I mean, I was, I, you know, had my set hours and it worked with my schedule. And then of course the perks is, you know, I get to get my hair done for free. So I stayed, you know, together. And, um, yeah, so that, that was actually, I mean, I I knew that I wouldn't be there forever. It's kind of like a means to an end, but it was a nice little job. Like I didn't have to be on my feet all day and I could like during the downtime, I could like study, you know, if, you know, when it got slow. So it was a nice little setup. So how long were you there before you switched to your next job? I was there, um, for about, I think I worked there for almost two years. And then, and then, um, as I got closer to graduation, um, I started doing little internships that were like more in, I started exploring more career options that were geared towards my professional goals. So I remember doing a little internship at 
Fox five, because I, I, I went from wanting to be possibly a television producer to an, a, a news anchor. And I actually also interned at rainforest films back when, um, Will Packer was here. Mm-hmm. So I did that. I was just dabbling in everything. <laughs> And then I eventually moved to Houston and got a job working at a PR firm. Ah, okay. So what did you do to get your foot in the door there? So it's actually funny because I did an internship at this agency in Atlanta doing market research. So it's basically where you kind of, you look at trends and, you know, consumer behaviors, and you use those insights to inform communication strategies for like PR campaigns and marketing campaigns. And so I was on working on the Coca-Cola team doing so online listening. So we were like literally l- analyzing the conversations that teens and moms were having about Coca-Cola. And the funny part is, I sucked at that job when I got it. And I, and I knew that it was not going to lead to a full-time job, which was the end goal. But I basically, you know, got let go after the internship. And I just, I mean, the boss that I had, I just felt like I was not good enough. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because this is where like, you always end up where you're supposed to be, like Mm -hmm. takes place. So I, I didn't get that job, but I'd have that experience on my resume and I ended up getting a job doing close to that same thing at an agency in Houston. And that's what led me to move to Houston because I was working at the the largest PR firm in the world, which is Edelman. Mm -hmm. And um, I was doing market research, except now I was doing it for oil and gas companies and like consumer companies. So I was working with big brands like Exxon and Shell and GE and Kia Motors. And my boss loved me. So the the first time I did it, I didn't get the job. And then the second time when I moved to Houston, I was doing amazing. And she's like, you're great. Wow. We have something (laughs) in common. I interned at Edelman PR, but in New York. So that's really? crazy. I sure did. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. So wait, um, do you know, wait, you don't know Jana Hughes, do you? No, I worked with a, a girl named Alexis. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Well, here, it's all about you. Not about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So you get this PR job and you take a risk in your career. At what point? When do you finally say, you know what? This isn't the direction that my heart is telling me to go in. I want to do something else. When did that happen? So that took about, I'd say two years. So when I got to Houston, I had this job in market research. So I was at the PR firm, but I wasn't really doing PR. I was doing market research, working with all the PR teams. And mm-hmm. eventually, after doing the the market research for a little, about two years, I started getting antsy. Like, I want to do PR. Like, I knew that I wanted to, to be in the PR world. I, I didn't want to do market research anymore. And the agency in Houston was just very small. Turnover was very low. It was a really good company, really good culture. I love the people there. And I can't really say that about half of the jobs that I've worked at. But that was one company I was just like, this is a really great company. And but so in order to get my feet wet into really doing PR, I ended up leaving Edelman and going to a smaller mom and pop um, agency in Houston to really get some hands on um, experience. And there it was only like three people, three employees. And this, the agency was owned by a late, uh, a lady. And after I started working there I just started getting even more antsy. Like I just realized that I could not sit at a desk for eight. Like this can't be life. Like, is this what I went to school for? Is this what I got in debt for? Like you're literally sitting at a desk being told what to do, being, you know, sometimes you're micromanaged, sometimes not, but like, and you're just looking outside, like waiting for the day to be over. Like that was just like, it was so, it was like, it made, I was just unhappy. And around that time is when I started discovering that people were doing this thing called travel blogging and it was around before I discovered it, but I would literally, I lie to you not. I would literally spend literally half my work day sneaking on travel blogs, reading about these stories of these girls who quit their jobs to travel the world. And it just seemed like such an elusive thing at the time. Like, how do they do this? Like, how do you just quit your job? You know, I was living in Houston. I had rent to pay. Rent is not cheap. How am I going to do this? 
And so, um, it wasn't until I was 25 at the time. And I felt like the, 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 the best way to start traveling was to just do it, like book a flight and go. And so I actually booked a flight to Spain for my 26th birthday. It was a solo trip. No one else was serious enough to go. Wow. And that kind of launched my whole travel thing. And then from there, I, I started my own travel blog. I started traveling, taking every vacation day I could to just explore the world. And then from there, I started doing some, being a contributing blogger to Huffington Post and then getting invited on press trips. And then the press trips are where you get to go for free in exchange for writing about your experience with these publications. Nice. And so, so I was <laughs> doing awesome. that. Yeah, I was doing that while juggling these jobs that I had and, you know, over the course of like two other jobs, because every six months I would just get that feeling like unhappiness again. So I would go and search for that happiness again, get a new job, feel good for six months. Then that pit in my stomach comes back. I don't want to be here. I don't want to sit in this office all day. And then it was finally, and then I, I think the last job before I finally stopped going from job to job, the, the, my bosses would literally like tell me my last job, I was actually fired because my boss was like, we can sense you're not happy here. We really want you to go out and do what makes you happy. And he gave me a severance and everything, but he just knew that I wasn't happy. And then that is how I transitioned into the yoga stuff. So you should send that boss a thank you letter. <laughs> I know, okay, right? <laughs> so now you have entered the world of yoga first as a student, of course. And then when mm -hmm. did you get that aha moment when you're like, you know what? I should probably teach yoga. I really love this. Well, I have been practicing yoga um, on and off and a lot when I was in Houston because I could actually afford a membership and the studio was like five minutes from my house. So I would go early in the morning before work. But, um, the aha moment to teach didn't happen until certain life situations, you know, pain brings you to your purpose without going mm -hmm. too deep into the pain part. But, um, Several life changes happened. I mean, I ended up moving back home and I had actually lost my job. I was on a backpacking trip with another travel writer in Columbia in um, October 2015 and we were robbed at gunpoint. So that was a very um, pivotal moment in my life, you know, coming back with post-traumatic stress, losing my job, moving back home with my mom. Um, ending a relationship. It was just like, okay, I'm like almost pushing 30 and I feel like my life is going backwards. And then, you know, social media doesn't help. So you're looking at all your friends making these strides. And I just feel like I'm like spiraling downward. So at that time in my life, I just really turned to my yoga practice and my spirituality. And I was seeing a therapist at the time. And that kind of brought me to going through yoga teacher training. Cause I just really need, I didn't, I didn't have anything else to do. Like I wasn't working and I was living with my mom rent free. So I was like, well, I'm going to use this time to just go through yoga teacher training to really deepen my practice. Never really, I didn't know straight off the bat that I was going to teach like I, in the capacity that I am now, because I never wanted to be a yoga teacher. Like I wanted to be a publicist, you know? Mm -hmm. But then when I got through yoga teacher training and how just transformational and amazing it made me feel, I, I wanted to share that with more people of color. I felt like there's not a lot of black people, just people, just diversity in general in the studios. And I'm like, well, surely they have to know how awesome this practice is. And I'm going to be the one to help open the floodgates to introduce more people, you know? And so that's kind of how that happened. Wow. And here you are today. Um, I want to be honest when it comes to hip hop yoga, because that's like the, spe the specific type of yoga class that you're teaching. I always thought that I would be too distracted in a hip hop yoga class because I love hip hop so much with all my heart <laughs> and soul that I felt like I'm just not going to be focused. I'm just going to be rapping the lyrics. Like I'm just not going to be, yeah. I'm gonna be all over the place. Yeah. But you truly have a skill of balancing the practice with the music. And where does that come from? How did you figure that out? I honestly don't know. I just know 
that I wanted to ha- find a way to combine the fun communal aspects of the class that I want, that I would love to experience, but still always come back to the true essence of what yoga is. So I just, you know, I was, I just intentionally weave in the, the themes and like, well, sometimes we do have a theme and sometimes I let my students create their own theme. So it's a balance between that, but just always, you know, we'll have our fun moments where we're laughing and where, you know, we're really enjoying the class. But then, you know, I do take those moments when we're in child's pose or when we're in certain poses to remind them that this is still, you know, come back to your breath, come back to your intention. And I, I, I don't know exactly how I do it. (laughs) I just, I just found, I just found my rhythm, my groove, because one thing that, that, that you learn in yoga teacher training is, you know, to teach authentically. And I, I never, there are classes and teachers that I personally love. And so some things, you know, you do take with you, like you're like, Oh, I like the way she cued that. Or I like the way she said that. I just always knew that I wanted to not lose the real essence of yoga. And so at the end, I always read a meditation. You know, we have that, that, that deep, you know, that good ambiance of the music at the end. But I, I just, I don't know a specific, like, well, first you do this and then you do this. I, I, I guess my structure in the, it, it's like, I guess from beginning to end, you know, when we start the class, we have the grounding moment where I have students come into their breath, you know, find their, set their intention. If I haven't already pre-planned one for them, then we start off with some floor based poses. Cause most of the time I start my students on their backs or maybe in child's pose. Then we crank it up, you know, doing the strong standing warrior poses, lunges and the big events. We do a lot of linking arms, um, And then as we get towards the end and we get back down to the mat, you know, coming back to that intention, winding it down, slowing down the tempo of the music, allowing them to do any last things they need to do in their body for their practice, and then ending with a a reading. So that's the main flow of it, but I don't plan what I'm going to say. I kind of just let, let myself speak whatever I feel. And a lot of times I do intertwine things that I'm personally going through. So if I was struggling this week with gratitude, then Mm -hmm. I may share that. Or if I struggled this week with not feeling good enough, then that may be the theme, like knowing that you are enough. So I incorporate a lot of my personal things into my class because I just feel like that's what helps me show up authentically for my students. Mm. Well, what has been your proudest moment as a yoga instructor? My proudest moment has is always when people come up to me after these classes and these events, like just um, the last event in Atlanta, you know, people telling me they drove from another city to come to this class and how transformative attending my classes or my workshops has been for them. I have students that will email me because sometimes when, I, well, when I've been on the road doing the tour, I like to check in with my the people who sign up for my email list. And, you know, I'll let, like, I'll tell them, like, I'll ask them, how are you feeling? Like, I want to hear from you. And students will be like, um, you know, because of you, I've been brave enough to face deeper things because there's only so much the yoga teacher can do. And some of my students have opened up about finally going to see, going to therapy or how much just attending my classes and hearing the the words that I say has changed them and made them want to go for their dreams and goals or to, you know, it's just like the things you hear knowing that I am influencing these people in this way feels good because I don't like people to feel like they're alone on an island. I feel like social media really triggers that. It makes you feel like you're, if you're, if you're not doing this, this or that, then you're not, your life isn't perfect. And the truth is nobody's life is perfect. And that's why I'm so open about things that I experience too. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's just good. The, the main thing that just feels so rewarding is to feel, to have people open up to me and tell me that my classes and workshops have changed their life for the better. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know if you've read this book before. It's called The Compound Effect, and it's um, written by Darren Hardy. And he argues in the book that a person's morning and their evening routines are the bookends of a prosperous life. So what are some things that you do in the morning, 
and at the end of the day, uh, consistently that you feel has helped you be who you are? So I'll be honest and say that since starting this business, having a set morning and evening routine has not been an easy journey, Mm -hmm. but I know that I, I always say this, I have to pour into myself before I pour into others. And, um, I love in the mornings getting on my mat, doing yoga or praying or meditating or maybe journaling in my gratitude journal, or, you know, if that even means, making a cup of tea. Like right now I'm drinking a smoothie. So it's not always a set thing because I mean, we're humans and we change from day to day. So I don't like to really get stuck in a a routine, but I know that in in the beginning, in the morning, it's about me. Like I need that time to just be still and be quiet and, and pick from, I have just a set of things like that are, that I call like that are important for self-care. So like I said, reading, yoga, meditating, praying, making a healthy smoothie. So I pick from, you know, whatever I feel like I need, you know, that morning. Mm -hmm. And, and then the evening, I just like to kind of end the same way. So I like to read something inspirational or, um, the evenings is really, I like maybe catch up with my mom cause she's off work or, you know, just, I like to spend time with, people that I love. So making a meal with the guy I'm dating or, you know, spending time with him Mm -hmm. or, you know, just like getting off of social media and just like really like being present, which is, that's the biggest thing for me, like putting my phone down and just being in the moment. Mm. Well, as a business owner, how are you also smart about money? I, so I have never, well, I, I guess I have been in, you know, in previous years, but the point that I'm at in my life right now, I don't feel the need to have a lot of stuff. And so Mm -hmm. I don't shop a lot. I don't, I don't feel the need to keep up with anybody or anything. I'm happy with less. And I've learned that even more. So like, even when I wanted to travel a lot, I realized that a lot of how these girls do what they did is they, they sold everything and they, and they lived with less. And so I started that whole minimalistic lifestyle several years ago. And I feel like, that is where true happiness is. The more you buy, the more you want. When you don't go in the stores, you're not seeing it. So you can't want it. (laughs) So I just don't, I don't like say, Oh, I like, I mean, yeah, there are times when I do splurge on nice things. Like I just bought myself a new um, blender, a ninja blender. And I bought myself a new luggage set for traveling, but I don't feel the need to shop a lot. And if anything, my money goes towards, juices, smoothies, yoga classes, but I'm not really a, I'm not really a spendthrift like that. Like I don't, I don't really spend a lot that I don't own things that I don't need. Yes. I'm all about that minimal lifestyle. I'm trying to get there. I'm really trying to get there. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, and then also, um, I was just talking to my mom about like budgeting and I, I'm going to start this new thing where I take out a certain amount of money a month out of my checking account. And once I spend that cash, then that's it because you can swipe, swipe, swipe all day. But if Mm -hmm. if you have like, if you just set aside, like if I take out $200 and I'm like, okay, this is it. Once this is gone, there's nothing else. And so I'm going to start kind of trying that too, like setting my budget and just taking out in cash and testing to see, because I think I'll be more also more conscious with how I spend once I see those dollars like diminishing out of my wallet. (laughs) <laughs> right. Exactly. That's a great tip. So hopefully our listeners um, take that advice for sure. Yes. Um, but what other advice do you have for young women who are inspiring or aspiring yoga instructors? What would you tell them? I would say to yoga, you said yoga instructors. Yeah. Girls who um, are thinking about taking that journey. They love yoga, but really don't know where to get started with becoming an instructor. What advice would you give to them? I would say the best tip is to just stay true to yourself and authentic. I mean, this, the yoga industry is definitely different today than what I say it was back when like several years ago, because now you have Instagram yogis and yoga celebrities and, you know, it's Mm -hmm. all like the, these poses and these leggings and how awesome, you know, you look in this, in this really challenging pose. And I would say, don't get caught up in that. Like 
you have to stay true to yourself and that's how you grow your student base and your following. Um, and, and people pick up on that. If you are trying to be a replication of somebody else, it's obvious. Um, just always teach from your heart and don't be afraid to not have all the answers and to be imperfect. Like I am not a perfect yogi, you know, like most people have this image of what a yoga teacher should look like and how we should act and what we should eat and what we should or should not say. And I am not about to be held in that kind of light. Like I'm not perfect. And if you're going to be a student of mine, you're going to know that I'm not the most enlightened. I'm not, tr- I'm not claiming to be, I'm on the same path as you. And mm-hmm. so I think just being authentic and true to yourself and just teaching from the heart and what you truly know and believe in is the best, the best way to go. Wow. All right. Now it's time for some rapid fire questions. Okay. All right. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you several things okay. so we can get to know you better. Um, what, what is your favorite book? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> favorite book, favorite book. Um, I, I, don't, I have a several, like I love, um, big magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. I love, um, dang, I don't have my, my iPad right in front of me. Oh, that's so difficult. Hey, well, you you could recall Big Magic quickly, so that's I'm curr- a good one. I'll tell you what I'm currently reading, America. Okay. I'm currently reading Americana. Okay. I think that's going to turn into a movie. But I like, oh, oh, I love The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer, I think. And okay. I like, um, Pima is a really good um, author. She just talks a lot about, you know, groundlessness and, you know, letting go, letting emotions come and go. Like if you're into that kind of like really like deep healing from within, she's a good author. It's hard to just nail down a favorite, like a favorite anything. (laughs) You love to read. So that's why that's hard for you. That's just like a part of your routine. You know, you love books. So I'm sure your list is super long for sure. Um, What's a small thing that you do each day that makes you happy? I, a small thing that I do each day that makes me happy, um, yoga, (laughs) I try to, I try to move my body in some kind of way, or, you know, even if that means reading something like, um, Rolf Gates meditations from the mat, like he has these daily little meditations. So I try to do some form of yoga every day. Okay. And how many days a week do you exercise typically? Um, I would say three to four. Okay. And do you have any favorite workouts other than yoga? Um, yeah. So I love rock climbing and I recently did a cycle class at a soul cycle in Boston. I like that. Um, I want to get into like more, uh, weight training, like to really like, you know, kind of bulk up my legs a little bit, but, um, I'm into anything that is active. So like hiking and just trying anything new. Oh, 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 and then also, how can I forget? I, um, sometimes take a hip hop dance class at the studio in Atlanta, which is also a lot of fun. It just kind of gets you out of your, out of your mind. Cause like you're looking at yourself in the mirror and it just, it helps me not take myself too seriously. Like I know I'm not, don't have the best rhythm, but it's just like, it just kind of gets you out of that, you know, you got to look or move a certain way. So that definitely helps loosen me up. <laughs> Where's the class? It's at dance. I think it's dance one Oh, one Oh one. Oh, it's a four one one dance four one one. No, it's not four one one. It's off of Briarcliff, I think. Oh, dance one one. I got to look into that. Yeah. Okay, cool. And they have these, right. they these Monday night, I think it's Monday and Tuesday, but I go to the Monday night one. Um, and I think it's at, seven or eight with Kevin. So yeah, it really gets you. Yeah, it's good. (laughs) All right. Okay. What's always in your gym bag? Um, water. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And what can make or break your workout? Oh, what can make or break my workout? I like to sweat. So if I, if I, if I have a good sweat, then I know I did, I did some work. (laughs) Okay. When you're working out solo, um, or no, when you're planning your music for your hip hop yoga classes, which which, um, songs typically make the list or which artists? So I always have some kind of Jay-Z in there and maybe some Kanye or Drake, their latest. And I even like Jay-Z's. I mean, I'm a Jay-Z fanatic, so I go all the way back with his songs. But yeah, 
Those are must adds. All right. And what's something you typically eat before workout? And also what do you normally eat after workout? So in the mornings I like to do, um, so I know you're supposed to eat light, but depending on when I work out, because I don't always work out at the same time. So sometimes before I work out, I'll do like a banana with almond butter. Or if it's, if I, if I don't plan to work out until the evening, then in the morning I, I'll do like an egg scramble. So I'll, you know, scramble up eggs with like tomatoes and onions and peppers. And I put it, I put hot sauce on it. So yeah, there's yeah. that. And then, <laughs> after, that good. and then after, um, working out a smoothie with like some protein in it. So. Yep. Okay. Or an Asahi bowl, one or the other. All right. And uh, what are your go-to beauty products? I have a very minimal beauty regimen. I usually um, wash my face with black soap. I've been doing it for years and it just works. And then in the evening after I do the black soap, if I have like a blemish or something, I'll put apple cider vinegar. It's like an apple cider vinegar waters mix, like half and half, um, like spot treatment. But in the mornings I'll put, um, some jojoba oil and then spritz rose water on my skin. Mm, okay. Yeah. Deodorant brands. This is like always a, <laughs> an interesting topic. Like what, what kind of deodorant do you use? So I've been experimenting with, you know, this nat, all natural deodorant thing and I'm trying to get it before it gets too hot. <laughs> but um, I recently, so I've tried Schmitz and it was okay, but right now I'm testing out this brand called Piper Y and it's P I P R W A I and it's like a charcoal based. Um, deodorant. So I guess that neutralizes the odor and the perspiration, but I've, I've been doing it for about a week now. And so far it's, it's been good. It's like, I think you can get a stick or you can get it in a jar and I have it in the jar. So I just take, scoop it out a little bit and just rub it into my, my underarms. And so far it's doing good. Okay. I'm so, I'm always so interested in hearing what type of deodorant everyone uses because I kid you not, everyone uses a different one and it's a different method or a different. So that's cool. I'm, I want to give it a try too. Well, um, my dad, he, my dad and his wife, they use lime. So they like literally slice lime in half and rub the lime on their armpits. And I get out. Yes. And, really? and yeah, that is there. And they, they say it works. I, I think I tried it once or twice, but I just never kept it up. So that may be another alternative. If you're looking we'll for the, you know, the all natural option. Yeah. All right. We're going to test this out. I'm going to have one of our writers do <laughs> <laughs> an entire like testing of all these different deodorants and write <laughs> right. which one works best. Really cool. Okay. So what does pretty girl sweat mean to you? I think pretty girl sweat means that. The, like, I think the brand is like basically welcome to like, it's welcoming all types of women, like bringing together that sisterhood, that community coming together in health and wellness. So like really cultivating that sense of it, it, it's, it's, it's cool to be healthy. It's cool to work out. It's cool to sweat. It's cool to take care of yourself. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I get when I, when I hear the name and when I see your brand. Awesome. Thank you. Well, what's next for you? Next, um, so I just wrapped up the City Winery Road Show doing all the cities, but I'm actually going to go back to all the cities in the next yeah. couple of months. And I'm currently um, planning a, a summer retreat. My Bali yoga retreat sold out in like three weeks. So I'm taking 18 people with me to Bali in September. But I'm um, currently working on a summer retreat. So... That is, and then teaching, I'll be teaching, um, I'm back in the studios in Atlanta in April. So I'm teaching my hip hop yoga class on Saturdays at Nirvana yoga studios. And then I'm doing my soulscape Sunday classes. So this, um, this month I'm doing soulscape to Lauren Hill and John legend. So mm, I like that. <laughs> I love that actually. And what is the most important thing you want to share with our audience? The most important thing I want to share is, hmm, these are some good questions. <laughs> I believe that a lot of times we go through life and we, we think that our lives are supposed to look a certain way. And if we haven't accomplished X, Y, and Z by this age, then we're not successful. But I would just say 
the key is to stay open, stay open to the transition and the direction that your life can take. A lot of times you don't get what you want, but you get what you need. And your, your plan may not always be the best plan. And just to be open with directions changing, taking another route, because that's just the beauty of it. Like, oh, I thought I was going to be a publicist on the red carpet in LA and now I'm a yoga teacher. So it's just amazing how you think you know what's best for your life, but things, you know, things will take you and, and experiences will take you in such a different direction. And I think it's just important to stay open. And that's Jamie. Follow the Atlanta-based yoga teacher and freelance writer on Instagram at Jamie Ratliff. You can also search for her on Facebook at Jamie, J-A-I-M-E-E, Ratliff. And visit her website, jamieratliff.com, to find out when her hip-hop yoga class is coming to a city near you. Just one more thing before you take off. Do you want to get a short email from Pretty Girl Sweat every Monday and Friday that serves as a daily dose of all things inspiring and allows you priority access to our upcoming events? Just go to prettygirlsweat.com. That's Pretty Girls with an S, sweat.com. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. And if you sign up, you'll soon discover that there's no hood like sisterhood. Until next time, always remember that good things come to those who sweat.